So what is this thing, GDNF? Well, it's glial-derived neurotrophic factor, and it's a protein. And we've known about trophic factors since the 50s, and the scientists that discovered that won the Nobel Prize. And the reason they got the prize was because these proteins have the ability to restore and regenerate damaged neurons. And this particular one, GDNF, has the ability to improve uh, terminals, the sprouting ends of dopamine neurons, where the dopamine brain cells are those pivotal cells lost in people with Parkinson's, leading to stiffness, slowness, and tremor. So if you have GDNF as your protein, then where are you going to put it in the brain? And where you're going to put it, it really depends on where those dopamine cells are. And the cells, which are shown here, are down in this part of the brain called the nigra, and they send out these long projection arms where the terminals deliver dopamine in the so-called striatum of the brain. And so if you take your protein, GDNF, and put it into the striatum area of the brain, then you can sprout those degenerating dopamine terminals. But the problem is, how do you get that protein in the brain? Because if you take it by mouth, it won't get in in sufficient concentration. So you need a surgical delivery approach. So, face, so that was the challenge, uh, which is good, because it's good to have something to aim for. So what do we need? This is the Bristol Brain Centre, and a minor achievement partway through this is we managed to raise one and a half million through some other funding, charitably, and, and through some big donors through the University of Bristol, and built the centre. And we've, here we've got uh, Christina uh, having her infusion. This is the pump system here, and these are going in. And when people come, we ask them about any side effects. And as I say, they come on a monthly basis for these brain infusions and then during the study not only are we looking at outcomes like how they cope with the uh, infusions themselves or side effects from the infusions or how their motor response is, how's their tremor doing, how's their stiffness doing, how's their slowness doing. We also have brain scan imaging with PET scans and those were done at Cardiff so we shipped people over to Cardiff and then we sent the scans to uh, Canada to try and avoid any bias so we had the University of British Columbia analysing these and this is a PET scan and Vesna Sossi and John Stossel were involved in this and this is trying to look and see whether dopamine nerve endings on the PET scans as a biomarker were better after the nine months of double blind treatment than they were at baseline. And then at principle of all, uh, after the participants, are the two charities. So it, we've been fantastically lucky, we've got the Cure Parkinson's Trust and Parkinson's UK, and it's been a huge commitment for both of those charities. This was a massive project to undertake. I have to say it was fraught with risk. And at the beginning, um, I thought we we're never going to finish this. Uh, not, not because I thought things would all go terribly wrong in terms of people being very, very unwell, although that was a risk, but simply the numbers involved and the size of the project and the complexity of the project with its many parts. And so it was a big risk for Parkinson's UK to take it, and I think it was absolutely the right thing to do to get back on in there at the forefront of research and something that really might mean the next quantum leap forward for Parkinson's, as I say, whatever this shows. So what's the progress so far? Uh, how are we doing it? How are we getting there? And are we going to get there? Are we going to learn something about how to deliver drugs to the brain? So we started in late 2012 with six pilot participants, and they went through in fairly quick succession, and they had nine months of GDNF or placebo, and four had active, and two had... Uh, placebo and then they had nine months of open label so we knew and they knew that they had GDNF and some of those people have continued to have infusions after that in a longer term extension study. So we learned many things and the reason we had the pilot thing there was one to get some safety data so the MHRA which is the regulatory body said yes you can do more provided these six go okay. And that was the point at which I gave my last lecture, lecture in 2013. So that was the point where we, we collected some safety data. We were allowed to start. What we learned from the pilot subjects was many things about the device. And we, we wanted to take the opportunity with those participants to try and perfect the device a bit further, bearing in mind that there were many steps here that were new and first in human. Um, those early devices had a different type of silicon, and some of them blocked off. Uh, so some of those participants haven't been able to uh, carry on having infusions, although they have continued to be assessed. 
and some have, but what it does mean is that for those people, we now have more than two years' worth of data and also people who stopped. What it means over time is we'll be able to see whether they improved or not when they were on active and placebo, then whether they improved more when they had open-label GDNF, and then perhaps if they had to stop, whether they then started to deteriorate again. So these are very useful steps. Uh, we wouldn't have wanted their ports to block, but these are very useful steps in understanding drug and drug development. So then we come on to the main 35. So this was when we then started getting the next, and this was where Poxas UK were instrumental in the recruitment, and we had those 35 people coming in, and we started with them in uh, having infusions in 2015, and we had the last double-blind nine-month infusion with the last infusion, mystery infusion, in April 2016. We'll have done something that's never been done on a single site before, uh, and the reason we had to do it on a single site were various, but one of the things, it reduces the amount of variables. We've never done something of this size before, a surgical study this size in Parkinson's on a single site in the world ever has been done. So just getting to the end is an achievement. And another thing that's an achievement is that we've shown the delivery system works and people can incorporate in this into their lives. And it is very strange how this has become part of our routine life and... Uh, the research doctors and nurses who come are doing this every day, and we, we, we give infusions Tuesdays to Fridays, and here we have a row of our participants turning up. So this is really a paradigm shift. I want you to understand that. This is a paradigm shift in the way of giving treatments to the brain, where people are turning up once every four weeks. Uh, they come in, uh, they've, as I say, they're coming from around the country, so some people fly down from Scotland. They stay in a hotel the night before, and then they come up, they sit in one of these recliner chairs. We've got three people in a row here. They're plugged in. They have their infusion over an hour and a half. They're monitored for an hour afterwards, and then they go home. And this is an entirely different way of thinking about neurodegenerative diseases and their treatments. And I have to say, I'm very proud. When I go into the infusion, we realise that we're just doing this, and it's part of our routine lives now. And we have to collect a lot of data. So every... Other visit, people come off medications and have collections. Here's one of our participants who always wears fantastic shirts, so we're very, we're very glad of that. And we have something called a case report form. This is a leverage file. Each participant now has four leverage files, and this is about one-third of the room where the files are kept. And we have about 20,000 sheets of data, and data monitoring and cleaning is all part of a clinical trial. So everything has to be absolutely right, so that in the end, if this works, we get all the way across the river, and this can be submitted, this data, to regulatory bodies, not only in the UK, but in the States and in the rest of Europe. So if this is a new treatment for Parkinson's, it can be rolled out and available, and therefore it has to be um, uh, acceptable to regulatory bodies. So as I mentioned, the study's already a success in that we've given more than 800 infusions to the brain now. So 800 times we've infused different uh, participants coming up and infused the brain in these 41 people. We've done over 500 assessments. And in the first nine months and in the second nine months, no one dropped out. Amazing. All 41 people continued, so full re retention. And in the first nine months of the study, with everyone coming every month for infusions, so 41 people coming every month for infusions, we missed three in total in that nine months period. So absolutely amazing uh, commitment, really. This is down to the participants and the administrative team and getting everyone back and the team on the ground that everyone wanted to keep going. But does it work? That's the key question. And um, uh, what we can say is that the surgery is uh, doable and achievable and appears to be within the realms of neurosurgery. It's safe. It, uh, is a device that can work and continue to deliver to the brain. So the device works, and we appear to be uh, able to convect our treatment throughout the striatum part of the brain, so that works. Uh, the GDNF itself, from the assessments we have thus far, appears to be safe and tolerable, and that people can tolerate coming for monthly infusions. So all of those things are um, key findings. What we found at the nine-month point which doesn't necessarily surprise me, was that there was, uh, although there was a separation between the GDNF group and the placebo group, where patients on GDNF were doing uh, somewhat better, uh, that didn't reach statistical significance. What I can say here is that we're now exploring the full data sets, and there is more to come and more to learn from this, and there are other endpoints, including the PET endpoints, and there are other 
endpoints that we're looking at, not only movement endpoints, but uh, fluctuation endpoints. How do people in a diary day improve in terms of having dyskinesia or stiffness or slowness? How does that fluctuate? How did their medication change over the time of the study? How did they perform on walking tasks over the time of the study? Um, how did they perform in other aspects that we're looking at, like psychological status, depression, anxiety? How did they perform in cognitive tasks? And particularly importantly, what happens during the second nine months? Um, and do we need longer treatment? And is there then greater restoration? And perhaps more important than that, are there some, when you're looking at group statistics of means, you may wash it out, but are there some people who do respond and others don't? And then how do we understand that and how can we improve it for those that don't respond? in the future. So this study in total has cost uh, north of several million pounds to get through. Further studies, including larger scale studies done at multiple centres, will be of the order of $100 million. And at that point, it's really for pharma, the pharmaceutical industry to come in. Um, in the interim step between this and a large multi-centre study would be looking at, hopefully, the participants in this for a longer period of time, perhaps with or without a dose increase in the infusions they're receiving. And at the moment, we're further analyzing the PET and MRI data, and there's a meeting in New York in the week of December 12th to decide what Pfizer will do with the extension study. But my hope is that this will continue, and as we come to understand the results more, we will understand how better to give growth factors to the brain. So what does the future hold? Well, I think the future uh, is better from having done this study. So the successes of this study are, uh, we've got a device now and a system for getting treatments into the brain that may be applicable not only to Parkinson's but other neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's, Alzheimer's disease, and brain cancer. So at the moment in Bristol and London, about to start using the same delivery system that's been worked out in people with Parkinson's is uh, a study in children with brain cancer. There's another study that's just starting, or due to start in the early part of next year, looking at a different growth factor called CDNF that is happening in Sweden and Finland, and that's using the same device system in this approach. So we really have, with this study and with Parkinson's UK and Cure Parkinson's Trust backing, kicked open the door to this approach now, and uh, this is taking off and moving forward. So these are important things. We've understood and learned that we can use this. And the, the things that we're learning from this study may then be applicable to other types of therapies, like gene therapies and how to give um, genes that are helpful and implanted into the brain using some maybe similar surgical techniques and so on. So the future, I think, is good. There are many other things that are happening. You don't just have to take part in brain surgery research. The, both Parkinson's UK and CPT are leading on C Cure Parkinson's Trust with the Link Clinical Trials, and there's a uh, dossier of drugs that CPT are looking at that may slow progression of Parkinson's over time. So I would say that although we've perhaps learned much about the neurobiology of Parkinson's over the last uh, 20 years, over the next 10 years, I think things will come in. I know it's always 10 years. Over the next 10 years, I think things will come in that will begin to slow the progression of GDNF, uh, progression of Parkinson's. I still believe that GDNF could be one of those, and I believe that we will uh, hopefully be able to go forward and show that with our current approach in Bristol.